Do you think I'm gonna find him here? Red butt. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember the closing lines? I do. Just, just yes. remind me. Uh huh. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> Say the famous line, and I'll and I'll see. Frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you said it with enough verb. Yeah, no, do right. it again. Don't be mean. Mean. Frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn. Okay, okay, maybe you'll do. I was just being polite. He wasn't my idea of Rat Butler. But then, everything changed. Frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn. <sighs> oh, so I'm coming over in palpitations now. <laughs> That's fantastic. You are a natural. Set against the backdrop of the American Civil War, Gone with the Wind tells the story of Scarlett O'Hara, a spoilt southern belle who goes from security to a home ransacked by the Union Army and from her first love, Ashley Wilkes, to Rhett Butler, the man she doesn't realise she loves until it's too late. The character of Rhett Butler comes from an amalgam of literary types and a real character in Margaret Mitchell's life. She was married to a man called Red Upshaw, which it doesn't take very much to see is similar in some ways to Rhett Butler. And Red was a man who was an exciting, sexy, dramatic uh, alcoholic who became quite violent and their marriage was a, a very short-lived affair. I went to Margaret Mitchell's home in Peachtree Street to find out more about her life. Well, welcome to the dump. <laughs> the dump? This is Margaret Mitchell. That's what she called her apartment, the dump. Okay. Margaret Mitchell lived here with her second husband, John Marsh, but he wasn't the inspiration for Rhett Butler. Husband number one, red hair, never finished anything. His mama kept sending him to one good school after another. He kept flunking out. <laughs> Red would have been the kind of boy down south people would say, well, he comes from a good family, meaning he was a total louse. <laughs> but she just had to have him. And her mama had told her, Margaret, when you have these intense feelings for a fella, there's only one thing that you can do, early marriage. And, uh, <laughs> but Daddy didn't like husband number one, and... Um, most of her friends said, you're marrying the wrong fella. This is John Marsh, mm -hmm. husband number two. Mm -hmm. And he's in his World War uh, I uniform. And this is the man she dedicates the book to. Sure. And uh, he always called her Peggy or Baby. Oh. And in this picture, she's not looking at John. She's looking at... Red Upshaw. Really? Yep. She's looking at red. When I think about the great classics of romantic fiction, it seems to me that they're not just simple love stories between a man and a woman. There's a third party in there as well, and that's the house. Think of it. Pemberley, Manderley, Thornfield Hall, and of course the sexiest love object of them all, Tara. She thought of Tara and it was as if a gentle, cool hand was stealing over her heart. She could see the white house gleaming welcome to her through the reddening autumn leaves, feel the quiet hush of the country twilight coming down over her like a benediction, feel the dews falling on the acres of green bushes starred with fleecy white, see the raw colour of the red earth and the dismal dark beauty of the pines on the rolling hills. Houses play a role as the ultimate destination, the kind of resting place for a woman's love, as you see in the classic book, like Gone with the Wind. There's a place, after all, is something that's always there. Mm. It's something that can't disappoint you. It's a point of stability, which is exactly the kind of thing that so many of these characters are searching for in love. Mm. An ideal point that won't disappoint them, that remains stable. Jane Austen, the Bronte sisters, Margaret Mitchell, they're what you might call the brand leaders in romantic fiction. And without them, I very much doubt whether Sophie Kinsella or even Helen Fielding would ever have been published. 
Women's expectations of real men have changed hugely in the last 200 years. But on the page, women still want their men unreconstructed. The Mills and Boone hero continues to give his heroine a punishing kiss. A lot of the romantic novelists I've talked to say that they write the heroes because they can't actually find the men that they really want in real life. Do you think that's going on a bit with your authors? Probably. And I think we read the heroes because, quite frankly, who would want to be trapped with an alpha male in real life? There's somebody who's storming around the house, slamming doors and shouting at you all the time. But in the books, they're sexy. And in the books, it's fantasy. And in the books, mm. it's all about desire. Mm. And then you can go away and have like a nice meal with your husband and talk to him like a sensible human being. And you get the best of both worlds. So it would be better... So it's not a good idea for men to read these books because they might get ideas about what women really want. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I've, I've given a few to my boyfriend and he comes back and he sort of sulkily says, am I an alpha male? And I have to tell him no. Do you think men have any idea when they embark on relationships, the expectation placed upon them by women who've read all these books and seen all these films, that, that you know, that, do they have any idea that they are expected to be all these things? Absolutely none. They have no idea. I mean, it was, it was quite funny walking down the King's Road on St Valentine's Day this year, because every third man was carrying an absolutely identical bunch of dark red, velvety roses from Marks and Spencer in their neat cellophane cone. And they were all looking slightly hunted. They'd all got a kind of checklist in their heads, you know, flowers, champagne, dinner for two. And it, they, they are struggling to meet the bits of the expectations that they can kind of get hold of, that they can understand. When you grow up reading romantic fiction, you yeah. do rather look for men like that um, as you, when, you're, when you're looking for men. And, of course, the men don't quite understand that that's what you're looking for. And yet, but the poor darlings, I mean, they're ticked off if they do anything remotely chauvinistic, don't they? Mm. So they have to be caring, sharing in the kitchen and do all that. And, and, and cater for one needs, use the voting expression, and then they have to be sort of match at the same time. So I think they're a muddle, poor angels, mm. really. But it's interesting, isn't it, how popular your books are, because that rather suggests that actually all women, what they really want is a sort of, you know, they want a bastard. Super, super bastard, yeah. I'm with Jilly. I like a bastard in bed with me, so long as he's safely tucked up in one of these. And I guess that's really the point of a romantic hero. Talking of which, I think it's time I got back to my man in the duffel coat. I think he's ready for a really punishing kiss. His lips pressed against hers. The grand piano. Shut it. In the third programme, I'll be examining why we are a nation of heroin addicts. That's romantic heroin addicts, of course. <laughs>